Voilà, bonsoir à toutes et à tous. Euh, on va commencer ce séminaire. All right, Donc, hello everybody. We will start this seminar. Welcome to the second online webinar of the CLTM Summer School. Let me start by saying that you can choose the language you want to listen to by uh, clicking on the small planet at the bottom of your the bottom of the window. Welcome to this conference called uh, Suffering and the Debt, What Solutions for the Countries of the Global South. I am happy to welcome all speakers for this discussion. The CLTM Summer School started last Tuesday with a first conference with Veronica Gago and Silvia Federici, who brought a feminist perspective on the multidimensional crisis. It's been recorded, so you will be able to find it on the CLTM website soon. And there will be a third conference on the cancellation of the debt bonds being held by the ECB. This will be next week. Those conferences are being held online. We would have liked it not to be this way, but we had to adapt to the COVID pandemic. This demands a lot more organization. So we want to thank from now on the interpreters and also particularly all the people working in the shadow, in particular, Bea, Remy, and Camille. But the good thing is that we will see each other for real on Saturday the 25th and Sunday the 26th in Liège, in Belgium, with uh, conferences on peasant struggles, social movements struggling, the, the Zapatistas visiting us, and lots of alternatives to put an end to the debt system. That's precisely on those solutions and alternatives that the CLTM works a lot. You can find a lot of our analysis on our website, cadtm.org. The CADTM is an international network which was created 31 years ago in Brussels. It worked first on the issue of public debt and it extended its analysis to private debt and the abolition of all illegitimate debts. We will discuss this topic tonight because the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic have aggravated the situation in the countries of the global south, especially for the most vulnerable, vulnerable populations and the women. Since So there's a third of uh, the countries from the global south which are on the verge of defaulting or have already defaulted on their debt. The solutions being presented by the international financial institutions are insufficient, as they say themselves. They only propose to suggest to suspend the payment temporarily. And the CLTM says that the lessons to be drawn are obvious. And among those, we should cancel debts for more social justice. This is why the CLTM supports a petition for the cancellation of uh, the public debt of uh, the countries of the global south. You will find a link in the chat of the Zoom. So you can check this petition and sign it, of course. For these countries to get out of the debt trap, should we cancel debt? Should we restructure debt? Should we implement citizen debt audits or international mechanisms under the supervision of the United Nations? These are all questions which will be discussed by four speakers tonight. First of all, we'll have Juan Pablo Bohoslavsky who is the independent expert on foreign debt and human rights, or was from 2014-2020. We have Andongo Sambasila, who is a Senegalese economist, member of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in Dakar and of the Collective for an African Renewal. Then we've got Yolanda Fresnillo, who works in the Eurodad network. And then we have Omar Aziki, who is a member of ATAC CLTM Morocco. Before we enter the discussion, let me say a few 
things on how the the evening will go first all speakers will have the uh, will have 50 minutes maximum each to make their presentation and then we'll have something like one hour to um react the speakers will have time to react to the questions which you will ask during their presentations so you can ask your questions in the in the q and a's um box of the zoom uh, window so you can write them there in whichever language you like and uh, also if you want a specific speaker to answer please say so first of all i will give the word to juan pablo bohovslaski who will discuss the solutions being suggested by uh, the um, united nations conference on trade and development all right the word is yours the floor is yours thank you thank you very much um uh, a note for the um, uh, for the organizer i shall share it with you also you can share with the interpreters my presentation as uh, it might sound a bit technical so i guess it, it's helpful for them um i shall send it by by email so many thanks for inviting me to be part of this summer university and it it, it is a pleasure to be in this panel with these distinguished colleagues uh the main purpose of this panel is to discuss possible solutions for the countries of the south crushed by the burden of the debt. Uh, so today I want to be uh, um, go a bit uh, further from what we can hear from a number of UN agencies, mainly making the point that temporary debt stands still from international financial institutions and bilateral lenders, and in some cases also comprehensive multilateral debt relief programs, um, and that courts must stop disruptive holdout creditors in courts, and, and also as uh, it will be uh, surely explained by other colleagues, uh, panelists uh, today, that austerity today could lead to a deeper recession. But today I would like to draw your attention on a crucial issue that goes unnoticed in the public discussion and even in the agenda of civil society organizations, despite its mm, multi-billion implications. Uh, I'm talking, I'm referring to the risk premium system that rules international finance. So I, I would like to share with you the main findings and arguments made in an article I just published with Oliver Paneke. Uh, I'm, I'm pasting now here in the uh, chatting room uh, for you the, the link to the article. It's open access, just one sec. Okay, here it goes. Great. Um, so I'm, I basically want to propose for, for discussion today a reinterpretation of risk premiums from a human rights perspective. As we know, the same product carries the same price, except for a loan. Due to risk premiums, some borrowers pay more than others for the same loans uh, to protect lenders from the possible consequences of high risk lending. That is fine, but the current approach ignores that paid installments reduce the risk over time. After the full payment of the principal, the risk is reduced to zero. So it's time to rethink this process to ensure that human rights are not violated and resources are, are rerouted to meet present needs. And let me elaborate a bit on this. Risky borrowers pay more for the same loans than low risk clients due to risk weighted um, interest rates that are based on the absence or quality of collateral. This approach treats collateral and risk premium in interest rates as exchangeable but why then is the collateral return at the end while the risk premium is not? This question should 
lead to a new interpretation of risk premiums built into the interest rates of loans that could release funds needed urgently to fight climate change and COVID-19. Credit scoring and credit rating uh, in, in the case of states and corporations are risk pricing tools to determine the risk premium added to the prime rate and must be paid by all risk clients. If the client's cash flow and the sum of the loan are identical, two main factors influence the risk premium, the collateral offered and the duration of the loan. These risk premiums are ubiquitous, uh, having their origins in the work of the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, which aims to stabilize international financial architecture. As a result of the Basel uh, Committee's work, uh, wagging uh, great risk has formed part of the architecture of international banking supervision for more than three decades. In accordance with the Basel Accords, the world's largest economy and most jurisdiction trading with them use this risk weighted interest rates. Apart from determining risk premiums and interest rates, the interest calculations are decisive for financial borders, regardless of whether the clients are states, businesses, or individual persons. A practically riskless client with excellent collateral poses no risk to the lender, even if the full payment of the principal is completed at a later stage. But defaults of borrowers without or with poor collateral are particularly risky at the beginning of the loan because the lender cannot recover the principal when few payments have been made. If simple interest rates and no risk premiums were applied in this situation, a risky borrower would pay the full principal to the lender only at the very latest stage of the loan. Yet, combined with compound interest, the risk premium serves as a payment accelerator that helps the borrower pay the principal more quickly to the lender. Uh, the risky phase at the beginning of the loan where uh, no or only poor collateral is available is shortened, while the paid installment reduces the risk over time. So ex ante, each client poses a different risk to the lender's investment, the principal, which necessitates different risk premium in order to prevent losses. But the borrower's real risk can be determined only exposed. Should risky clients turn out to be as reliable in repaying the loans, Different prices for the same loans are not justified, but turn into discrimination based on property, which is prohibited by a variety of legal sources in international law. And a growing of body uh, of case law also supports the prohibition of any discrimination that is based on property. So different prices for the same credit and the equal risk can be prevented either by returning the risk premium at the end of the loan or adjusting the risk premium, the interest rate over time, along with the diminishing risk, thus achieving either identical prices for all clients. Returning the risk premium is possible because it, it is only part of the interest rate, meaning the credit's market price and not the lender's property. Therefore, the risk premium should be returned like any other collateral as soon as the lender investment, that is a principal, is fully paid by the borrower. Uh, to sum up, adjusting interest rates and risk premiums after the full payment of principal prevents discrimination by securing the equal treatment of all borrowers once they have fulfilled their principal payment obligation. It would free up the resources of the poorest borrowers to improve their living conditions, enable uh, sovereign borrowers to implement poverty eradication policies, facilitate businesses, and create wealth for corporate borrowers. Using the full payment of the principal as a precondition for equal payment conditions 
among borrowers strikes a balance between the interest of the lender and the borrower. This approach creates no additional burden uh, for lenders. It simply corrects a poorly constructed finance practice without interfering with freedom of contract or market forces by treating interest rates as prices rather than property. This approach would also release resources during the current dramatic COVID-19 context in which fiscal space and household incomes must be devoted to save lives and ensure that basic economic and social rights are realized. Based on the Basel uh, Accords, banks are already required to adjust the risk management data at least quarterly. Therefore, banks are, are already legally obliged to collect the data necessary uh, for the adjustment of interest rates and return of risk premiums to the clients. While this may lead to less profit in the short term, banks would benefit from more reliable risk and a more stable financial market in the long run, as defaults are less likely to occur, which all threaten banks occasionally. All states, in particular G20 member states, should live up to their human rights obligations and protect the property of their citizens and corporations by introducing regulation that would require banks to pass on such client-related saving by returning the risk premiums in accordance with the risk adjustment over time, instead of letting finance institutions keep the saving as windfalls. This approach might contribute to the financing of a Green New Deal and the fight against uh, COVID-19, as I mentioned. Finally, I think this reinterpretation uh, I just proposed of risk premiums shows that human rights law has the potential and also the technical sophistication needed to challenge neoliberal finance and fight against inequality. Many thanks. Merci beaucoup, Juan Pablo, for cette, uh, cette alerte. Thanks a lot, Juan Pablo, for this alarm on the debt burden which is aggravating the situation of the poorest countries. I will now give the floor to Endongo Sambasilla, uh, who will take the floor on the specific constraints uh, for the Global South in the current situation. All right, the floor is yours. Merci beaucoup. Et merci à tous les organisateurs pour cette invitation. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot to all organizers for this invitation. My talk will not be focused on the on the current aspects of the situation on the developing countries. I will rather discuss the structural reasons which uh, justify the fact that this is a problem for the global south indebtedness public indebtedness my first item is on how the indebtedness of the global south is an indicator of limited sovereignty second item is why those countries are indebted what are the reasons third i will discuss why indebtedness of the global south is a necessity for the capitalist system. And last, in the fourth item, I will discuss perspectives on how to exit the debt system. F Public indebtedness in foreign currency indicates a limited sovereignty. First of all, let me define monetary sovereignty. As the modern monetary theory says, sovereign states are those who can collect taxes on their jurisdiction. These states can then cannot emit a debt in a foreign currency. A sovereign state is dependent on their own currency. First of all, this means that these countries have no 
structural financial constraint. These states are not financially constrained. They cannot be unsolvable in principle. And according to MMT, these states have the capacity to borrow at whichever interest rate they wish. For instance, they can borrow at the same interest rate as the rate of growth of the GDP. So monetary sovereign states generally have no problem of public debt. So here I'm not talking of states such as Greece because Greece has no monetary sovereignty. In rich countries, public debt generally increases during crisis periods in order to decrease the um, uh, household indebtedness. In rich countries, the problem is about household indebtedness. In poor countries, the problem is with public debt because those countries have a limited monetary sovereignty. If you look at Japan, Japan has, has a public debt of 250% of its GDP, but it has no problem with its public debt. Senegal, before the pandemic, uh, hit had a public debt of 65% and yet Senegal had a, a problem with its public debt because most of its public debt was held in foreign currency. So now the question is, why do developing countries borrow in foreign currencies? This is because these countries are in a situation of economic and financial dependence. What do I mean by financial dependence? Well, developing countries cannot solve the deficit of their payments balance in their own currency. They need to borrow to do this. Rich countries do not have this problem because they have a reserve in foreign currencies or in the currency, in the currency that they own. Or they are countries that can have foreign currencies without huge devaluations. We have a problem, which is that there is no free mechanism of conversion of one currency into another one. And so this is why dependent countries suffer this situation. You can see how some countries, when they are in a specific situation which is not in their favor, for example, when the cost of raw materials decreases, then deficit increases and the debt becomes more expensive to repay. Because if you want to convert it in the local currency, then the, well, the, the charge of the debt in local currency increases, obviously. Another thing is that the domestic financial system is dominated by foreign actors in those, poor, in those poor countries in a very colonial manner. In many African countries, financial systems are not functional. They just finance commercial and rent activities just as it was under colonialism. If you look at Senegal, the banking system allocates uh, very little credit to the real economy, generally with uh, e extremely expensive rates, extremely high rates. And then the other aspect is economic dependency after financial de dependency. First of all, the problem here is the international division of labor where the global south exports raw materials and imports any products with an um, added value from the global north. Second problem, the global south has develop, development schemes which are very much depending on the global north because these development schemes are based on inputs which must be paid in foreign currency. So what they, when they do not own those for, this foreign currency, then they need to attract foreign investors to have access to these inputs. The development as it was led since the Second World War 
never allowed the developing countries to get out of this dependency. On the contrary, the World Bank is not interested at all in the development of agriculture in the global south, for example. The goal of the, of the World Bank is to make those countries a destination for agricultural products of Europe and the US. Similarly, the World Trade Organization and the IMF uh, lead measures which aim at putting the countries of the global south in, a, in the situation of dependency from the global north. You can read a book um, written by John Perkins, uh, The Confidence of a Financial uh, Murderer, where he describes how these countries were forced to or were maintained in a dependency situation. A third important dimension is the matter of economic surpluses. That is funds that can be mobilized for domestic investment and you can see that in rich rich countries, uh, in the mining sector and the oil and gas sector, there's a time when people were talking about African Africa rising. We saw high growth rates in Africa, and we saw quite a high level of capital flight, actually, especially the repatriation of profits from these sectors. So during that period from 2000 to 2016, 16, the total accumulated uh, profits were some $500 billion taken out of Africa. Uh, so some 85% of the GDP of the continent and the interest payments on debt during that same period were some 100 billion. So profit repatriation was actually five times higher than interest debt interest payments and that actually shows how far the countries of the global south have lost control over their economic surpluses and so this the this domination of the north countries of the north just justifies this uh, economic dependence of the countries of the south and corruption of course hurts africa and so this also contributes to the flight of resources that uh, could and should be invested in Africa itself. When we look at the scale of financial flows, uh, we're talking about uh, multinational corporations and, uh, and criminal organizations. And the policies pursued are often discriminatory Michael Alambasino Overstand wrote a book called Sovereign Bond Issues, New, if New African, African Countries Pay More. It shows that African countries pay higher interest rates, some 2.9% higher, 2.9 percentage points higher. So, so why do countries of the Global South increase their debts? Well, they can't really do otherwise because their development model is based on investment on funds from the north. They don't have their own resources and so therefore have to borrow in order to fund this Im imbalanced uh, financial model. The third point model, the third point I wanted to make is that permanent indebtedness of the countries of the south is the system as such. An important book was published earlier, Criminal Patterns of Unequal Exchange, Implications for Sustainable Development in the 21st Century. This paper shows that if you divide the country into two parts, the South and North, and not in counting China, you realize that the countries of the South have a net transfer of wealth, of raw materials, labor, and so forth. But you have a net transfer of, of physical resources, you also see have a net transfer of financial resources as well. So what does this mean? It means that we lose on both fronts in terms of physical resources, but also in terms of monetary flows. And 
So how can all this, how can we square this circle? Well, the system requires that countries permanently have these debts. So just to wrap up, I would say is that you have to distinguish between the country of cancellation of existing external public debt. There, I think there are a lot of arguments in favor of, of canceling the existing stock of external debt on the one hand. There should be no just, there's no justification for continuing to service the debts. And so we should have to break out of this situation which favors creditors. We have to go toward a system that is uh, that favors, that fosters development in the countries of the global south. Once the debt has been cancelled, and we, we saw that some debt was cancelled nearly 2000, but then it uh, new debt was accumulated. So we do have to cancel the stock of debt, but it has to be part of an overall package to, to reorient the economic and financial system and uh, project in the countries of the of the of these countries it should serve the economic needs of the peoples the communities in these countries the investment should be mobilized locally rather than turning to dollars or euros or other hard currencies a lot can be done can be done by focusing on local innovation third we need greater co monetary cooperation between the countries of the global south to to reduce dependence of uh, on countries of the global north and china uh, we we can go we need programs of research and development uh, to work, to work on energy self sufficiency and this will help us get out of the debt system and this is this is necessary in addition to canceling the existing stock of debt. Thank you for your attention. The interpreter apologizes, but the sound quality was very poor, and we did the best we could. Thank you for those comments on the structural nature of debt, and thank you also for talking about how we might the countries of the global south might be able to deconnect, disconnect rather from the global financial system dominated by the countries of the global north and their financial institutions. I'd now like to give the floor to Yolanda Frenillos, who will be talking about the recommendations of the Eurodad network, the need to reform the debt architecture and the proposals, uh, proposals that put together for overall debt suspension. Um, don't uh, hesitate to ask questions in the Q&A uh, section. Over to you, Yolanda. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, uh, I'm I can't not turn on my camera. Turn on says this my speaker. camera at the moment. There seems I to be a problem with problem my webcam. You. So I'll just start talking, and I'll be speaking in Spanish and Castilian. Okay, here we go. Now you can see me. Thank okay, you very much. Great. So now it's working. Thank, Thank you, very you for, much inviting, for me. inviting me. This is and not the first time um, I've spoken at not, the CAD, CAD it's, it's um, great to be here at the uh, summer, summer University. university. It would have been, would have been wonderful to have met you all in person and uh, to, to see so many of you again. So many good friends. But anyway, so of course, delighted to be here. here. Not, Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Let's see if I can share my screen with you. What I want to show you. Because what I'd like to do is share some images with you. I just wanted to you. share a few images with you, so I hope you can see this well. Okay, great. So as Anais, as was Anais saying, said, I'm going to speak I'll be, uh, about some of the talking to you about a few proposals society, from social society, from from civil society not just from the international Eurodad, coalition, which but also the international coalition that year, came together last this, year. Uh, society coalition, which was in the context of the deepening of how the it debt crisis because we could see that the situation of debt was getting much worse i'd also, like to, I'd also like to explain exactly how this impact of covid the economic uh, impact of covid on debt levels i'd like to speak about that a bit and as colleagues have said 
this is a recurrent issue. It is not as it's not the debt issue is not as a result of the pandemic or COVID, and countries in the global south have were already facing the debt issues, debt disasters, and this has uh, only got worse. And according to figures of the last uh, since twenty between 2011 and 2020, the sovereign debt of the external sovereign debt in country, in developing countries rose on average by 40.2%. Um, it went from 40.2% to 62.3% of GDP. And this happened also in the global north in the last few years, similar figures. Uh, but in the global south, um, we saw the situation got very bad in 2020 as a result of the pandemic. The multilateral response to this increase in debt, I'm not going to go into great depth here regarding the impacts of that increase in debt. Uh, if you were not there on Tuesday um, when we uh, had present, when we had other presentations, maybe you could go back and look at that because we heard about the specific impact on women. Uh, so high levels of public debt, how that has an impact on women in particular and how that creates great uh, indebtedness among families and particularly women, particularly migrant women, um, with women who suffer racism, women who suffer uh, specific vulnerabilities. And I'd like to speak about what the response has been given this rise in debt, the response of international financial institutions. And we know that we cannot expect a great deal. We can't expect great things from these international financial institutions, but basically they've done what they have done. They had done on other occasions. So the crisis of the uh, 70s and the 90s, that all they did is just add more debt, so more fuel to the fire, more credit um, issues. And so the net transfer only in 2020 of resources from global, from countries in the global south to the global north, it was $194 billion of value. So if we take into account the new loans to countries in the global south and then what has been paid from countries in the global south to their creditors, well, that last figure is incredibly high. And this is despite the fact that, the fact that credits to countries in the global south have increased. So um, the World Bank uh, and the in and the World Monetary Fund, the International Monetary Fund had invested with, uh, and uh, they imposed conditions of austerity, uh, which are now are making the situation much worse. And in the case of the World Bank, the loads, the loans mainly um, benefit the private sector. There has been, they've strengthened this discourse of access to financial markets. And Don uh, Basamba spoke about how after the debt cancelling that took place in the early 2000s, this debt has increased once again. And this is because they make the most of this public debt or debt to creditors, public creditors such as the international institutions and also uh, the European states. And so they wanted to open up more space for financial markets for investors. And uh, sometimes they see that things they, um, maybe there's quantitative easing and it's actually easier to lend at much higher levels to countries in the global south. And so the response to the uh, to COVID has been, let's improve that access to financial markets. Let's exacerbate the situation. And so the, lo the loans have gone up, the interest rates have gone up and the rating agencies have continued to uh, downgrade the credit ratings for countries in the global south that are restructuring their debt. And the IMF has, after a lot of pressure, the IMF has um, spoken about a new tool which helps to generate reserves in countries that are members of the funding question. And given that it's an institution, a non-democratic institution, where resources are shared out on the basis of the voting rights of each country. And then that is the, on the base, done on the basis of the financial resources of the country. And so this means that it is the rich countries that are taking the decisions. And now uh, they are studying the possibility, they're examining the possibility of transferring some of the 
uh, resources to the poorest countries, but the IMF is saying that this has to be done in the form of new debt, so new loans to the poorest countries. And the two initiatives, uh, so alleviating debt, alleviating debt, not canceling debt, but just alleviating debt, and th this is the temporary suspension of payments agreed on by the G20 in April last year, and this was offered by bilateral creditors, so countries of the G20, for example, and the Paris Group, so also China has been inc included in this initiative. And the outcome of this is that um, up until Ju June 2021, uh, they have uh, the payments have actually been 2% of the debt. And so creditors, private creditors and multilateral creditors have been left out of this initiative. But furthermore, it's not cancelling, it's just a temporary alleviating. And so that means that the, the payments have to continue and the payments do have to go to the creditors. And given the great limits of this initiative, the G20 last year came out with a new initiative, new among commas, um, so it's a new uh, in, in inverted commas. So it is a new framework it's not it's not actually new and it's not even a framework it's just a it's just a paris club uh, using the tools that already existed for restructuring debt and adding china to the group of creditors that are taking part and it's not in common because the multilateral bodies are not taking part and there are many doubts in terms of who which private creditors are taking part and then it's not for everybody either because it includes it excludes most of the middle income countries and what this new framework has achieved and anything that's achieved so far is that the rating agencies have downgraded the ratings for countries that have been daring enough to ask for a restructuring of their debt not cancelling the debt but a restructuring and uh, that's what this new framework was doing and what it seems with what we're seeing is this there's a new wave of austerity the International Monetary Fund itself is actually promoting the fact or asking that 60% um, of countries in the global south reduce their, uh, reduce the, the, uh, the public services in order to reduce their debts. And this austerity will, um, will prey on the most vulnerable, on the women, the children, those, the elderly, uh, those in vulnerabilities and those who should be the ones with the right to life and the right to development. And uh, we, in addition to this, we have the, um, the climate emergency, climate change, which also has an impact on the debt issue. So in an increase in extreme climate events, above all in uh, countries in the Caribbean, small islands in Central and other countries in Central America. So these countries have to indebt themselves in order to rebuild after the climate disasters and the lack of investment for financing development uh, or financing climate improvements for the most polluting countries. Well, this means that global South countries have to take on debt in order to finance the mitigation and adaptation measures. And this increases their debt and the, the more debt there is, the fewer resources that are available in the country after the disaster, so as to invest in climate resilience. And the more climate vulnerability there is, the more the the more expensive the debt is and the, the higher interest rates the countries have to pay. And so it's a vicious circle, a vicious debt circle and a climate change circle. Uh, and it, it's a feedback loop. And this crisis has a particular impact on women and gender minorities, and it has an impact on gender justice. And in the questions, if you ask more questions, then I'd be happy to go into this further. And so, what are we asking from the civil society? Well, before, uh, come, be, well, uh, before coming to the civil society groups, um, countries had been asking for actions. They'd been asking for a response to this situation. They'd been asking to restructure or to cancel debt. And in this case, well, the last statements of the prime ministers of Bangladesh and Barbados were demanding a cancelling or restructuring of the debt for the countries most affected by climate change. This is one of the trends that we're seeing, but then there are other countries as well that have been asking for reforms to the international financial system, uh, whilst also asking for real true cancelling of debt for their countries most affected by COVID and 
also this increase in public debt. Last year, in roughly at this time of the year, uh, we came together as different civil society organizations and we had a global week of action for cancelling debt. And here you have the website and I can share it to you later on in the chat box and the requests, the demands that we reached, that we agreed upon that that event were that uh, we, the unconditional cancelling of public debt for all, uh, all um, countries that need it, and uh, this is private, public, creditors and others, and um, and we have indicators from the IFIs, so there are middle-income countries that are very much affected by the um, crisis, I apologize if I'm speaking, but first, the speaker, and um, so those resources which are liberated in order to address the needs of the population, that should be taken into account. And so civil society was has demanded that this that there should not be conditions for cancelling the debt. It should be a sovereign decision of the countries in the global south. And the, in the coalition, we have organisations from the global south. And so this is a demand to their governments, their rulers, to use these resources so as to invest in the well-being of the population. One of the requests that was put on the table was uh, uh, looking at uh, having a national debt audit, so uh, reanalyzing the debt and looking at the debt and looking at is this legitimate debt, is it sustainable debt, and uh, asking for the unsustainable and illegitimate debt to be cancelled. A fourth point, which uh, caused a lot of discussion and debate in civil society, was setting up a framework under the auspices of the United Nations, which is fairer, which is more transparent, which is more predictable, linking up multilateral bodies in order to solve the debt crisis. So nowadays, when a country has problems uh, paying their debt, they have to negotiate a loan with all of the creditors. They are completely alone in their position as debtor, and there is no international system with, um, for bankruptcy for certain countries, or there's no fair solution that can be offered in this kind of situation. And then review, reviewing loan conditions is another point. So, as Juan Pablo was saying, we have to look at responsible financing from creditors or from loan providers and having responsible loan levels and um, interest levels. And so, responsible a responsible approach so as to avoid, avoid the accumulation of unfair debt that cannot be paid off in the long term. And then the primacy of human rights, given debt payments, and here there are requests also to review the concept of what it means to cancel debt and here are or sustainability of debt as well. And Juan Pablo was in the, uh, was in a position at the United Nations on human rights. And he said that we cannot consider a debt sustainable when in order to pay it, a country has to give up the pro providing human rights for their own population. And so this is what we're seeing today and this has to change. And then finally, reparations for countries that have suffered damage as a result of the unsustainable debt and illegitimate debt that they have had. Now, this, the, this idea of transforming economic and financial systems, well, there are, there are demands in that area as well. And as Ndongo said, even if debt is cancelled, well, if everything remains the same, then it means that debt will accumulate. So we either have to change that financing system or change the monetary system. And we have to guarantee that countries can defend their own monetary sovereignty and looking at economic and financial conditions or simply cancelling debt. So as we put the clock back to zero, the counter back to zero so that we can uh, start from scratch. And what, just in the last few minutes, what are we planning in the next few months? So these mobilizations from last year will be repeated this year. The mobilizations from last year were online. This year, they uh, we cannot change that. It will be the same again. It will be online. And, and in some countries, we will have face-to-face -face events happening and demonstrations taking place. And it's not one week, but rather two weeks. Uh, these days of global action for cancelling debt the 15th to the 30th of October this year. And on these days, we have a campaign, a specific campaign for cancelling 
debt and working for climate justice. So really is linking up the issues of debt and climate. And on the 22nd of, a, of uh, well, the, the dates that um, by, uh, well, we've got a campaign that we are developing on Twitter for uh, debt justice. And we will have local actions, workshops, and we're doing our preparatory actions. And um, you can join us for that. This is open up for any activists who want to join. And now we are uh, trying to organize simultaneous interpretation as well so that everybody can listen and follow in their own languages. And over these days, well, why over these days? Well, because we have a number of international events that are taking place. So this week, we have the UN General Assembly, and we have a number of things at the UN level. And we've also got the UNCTAD summit at, at the beginning of October. And then we've got the IMF and World Bank annual meeting 11th to 17th October, and then the G20 meeting at the end of October. And, and I think it's not on the screen, but we also have COP26. Yes, it's there on the screen. So that's the first two weeks of November. So these are international events that mean that we should mobilize. And now COVID doesn't make it easy to mobilize physically or face to face. Um, we can't do all of what we would hope for, but we are going to try our best. And in another column, you have some of the uh, alternative initiatives. So um, we have this uh, summer university and then we will have the Global People's Assembly in parallel to the People's Summit, uh, the Food System Summit. And then we have a civil society forum, which is in parallel to UNCTAD. And then we've got a number of days of action on the climate. And there's the global, global climate strike and then Thomas Sangara and uh, well, there's a lot of other events. Okay, now I will finish with the words of Thomas Sankara actually, who criticizes and the, the, uh, the system. He's saying that it's a, a, it's a casino. And when people start to suffer, when it seems that people, when, well, people ask for reimbursement eve of the of the money they have invested, even if it's at the cost of human lives. Thank you. Merci, Yolanda. Merci pour cette mise en évidence de la... Thank you, Yolanda, for highlighting the responsibility of international organizations in the current indebtedness of uh, the countries of the global south, which is increasing. And thanks as well for the proposals you're putting forward. As for other speakers, you're putting forward solutions such as implementing an audit, an audit or a multilateral mechanism for restructuring the debt. I guess we can debate these proposals later on. I will give the floor to uh, Omar Aziki now, who will present the uh, solutions put forward by the CLTM network, which are rather oriented at the sovereign act. If you have questions, please free to ask them in the chat or in the Q&A box, because after Omar Aziki's talk, we will uh, read them out loud and the speakers can react. Thanks a lot. Hello, everyone. My talk will focus on trying to answer the question of uh, what can be the solution for the countries of the global south facing the debt crisis. Indeed, the pandemic renewed the debate on the debt issue. Several initiatives were launched to try and find a solution to this debt crisis for the countries of the global south, which are seeing a drastic decrease of their financial income because of the COVID crisis. From March 2020 onwards, there was the risk of a wave of uh, defaults. This frightened the creditors, the international financial institutions, as well as the governments of the global of the countries of the global north. 
and these creditors multiplied initiatives too under the under the pretext of alleviating the financial conditions of the debt for instance you have the new funds for assistance and response to catastrophes which has been modified in march 2021 yolanda also mentioned the initiative taken by the g20 of uh, the suspension of payment of the debt in November 2020, you could also see you could also see the G20 and the Paris Club taking initiative to alleviate the debt beyond the suspension of payment, which was a proof that the first measure taken was not enough. And then in August, the IMF agreed to increase the special drawing rights to put $250 million at the disposal of the world economy, as they say. But as Yolanda highlighted already, the experience of the 1980s, the 1990s, as well as, uh, as, well as several analyses, confirmed that these measures are very much insufficient to face the the debt crisis of the countries of the global south and are very much below the real stakes. So really, there's not much to expect from these initiatives of the international financial institutions because they are very much the benefiting from the debt system, as Ndongo said. The other thing is that these measures exclude or do not mention the role of private creditors. And we know that nowadays, most of, most of the public debt of the countries of the global south uh, is borrowed on the private markets, the private international markets. So these measures uh, uh, what's more, these measures exclude the countries with intermediate income, which constitute 73% of the world population. For example, if you look at Lebanon, they are now in a dire situation and they are excluded from these mechanisms. Another thing is that the rating agencies, as Yolanda said, they play the role of the police by um, taking down the sovereign rates of countries, the sovereign uh, notes attributed to countries. So the problems are actually being delayed rather than being solved through a full cancellation of the debt. Actually, what we can say does, is that these international financial institutions are relieved that they were able to avoid the worst scenario in this COVID catastrophe. And they managed not to reform the debt architecture, but rather to just avoid debt cancellations and to avoid the real debate on debt cancellation. To these, you can add a series of statements which are rather rhetorical and are not followed by any practical measures. For example, the statement of the African Union or of the Prime Minister of Pakistan or of the President of Senegal. I'm not even mentioning the Pope or Emmanuel Macron. They all made rhetorical statements which actually helped international financial institutions to avoid the worst case scenario. Let me add one thing made by the independent expert on foreign debt and human rights, which was published on the 4th of August, which focuses on a reform 
of the international structure of debt uh, in relation with the human rights. It's an interesting report given its uh, strong criticism of the IMF, but the proposals are very much focused on reforming the IMF, reforming the um, notation agencies, Let me say that we, as CLETM, sent proposals in the framework of um, the contacts that were uh, made by this independent expert, uh, but our recommendations were not taken into account and we were not mentioned in the report. For the CLETM network, the measures we put forward are both effective and they help focusing the discussion on the real things which could help alleviate the debt system. The CLTM network works with a lot of organizations, movements, networks, and we worked together with Yolanda in Eurodad. On the international level, we initiated and supported several calls made by social movements. We supported several activities on um, trying to put forward the possibility of cancelling public debt. Now we can say that the question of the illegitimacy of debt and of the debt system and the illegitimacy of the international financial institutions is back at the center of the political and social struggles on the middle and long terms. Also because all the measures taken by those actors have only delayed the consequences, they have not solved them. The solution is not first and foremost a technical solution, it's first and foremost a political solution, as Ndongo mentioned. It's a solution which has to do with changing the system on the international level. Without a global cancellation that would concern all creditors, whether they are private, bilateral or multilateral, without such a cancellation, the countries of the global south will have to keep uh, focusing their resources on repaying the debt. Therefore, our main demand is about the immediate suspension of the repayment of the public debt. The amounts which will thus be saved can then be sent directly to priority sectors such as the health sector, but also other social sectors, such as um, education and housing. We'll have to implement mechanisms of people's control to make sure that these sums, that these amounts can be first and foremost allocated to health. Another measure which seems easy to take in order to free financial resources is to implement a, cri a special crisis tax on the wealthiest, on the big corporations which are responsible for tax evasion, freezing military expenses, putting an end to, to the subsidies being given to the banks and the financial system. So a whole set of measures which are part of a program opposing the whole architecture of the global financial system. As Ndongo mentioned, the cancellation of debt is not enough in itself. It must go together with a global questioning of capitalism as a system. In order to prepare the conditions for another balance of powers against those international financial institutions through strong people's mobilizations on the local, on the regional, and on the global level. 
même procédure, une, la procédure pour identifier les parties illégitimes de True. la or after such a social movement, we can then start identifying the illegitimate parts of the public debt. Stating such illegitimacy can lead to the cancellation of, of this debt under democratic control, which would be a political and sovereign act. This was done by Ecuador in a different context between 2008 and 2009, as well as Iceland from 2008 onwards. I will not go into details right now, but these are two experiences which show that disobeying the creditors is not a catastrophe and does not lead to a collapse of the country. On the other hand, the example of Greece where huge mobilizations were not followed by a sovereign political act, but rather by a sellout of uh, the Tsipras government before the Troika. And there we could see how the Troika was culprit, was responsible of a crime against humanity, against the Greek people. What's more, the CLTM tries to take part in several processes of citizen debt audit, and we try to initiate a democratic debate on these audit processes. From such debate, we can find collective proposals and via mobilizations and popular mobilizations, we can obtain the implementation of those proposals. What's more, we need to refuse and denounce the blackmailing being carried by uh, private creditors and by notation agencies. The citizen participation can demand that the national and international actors responsible for the uh, indebtedness and for the debt crisis should face charges up to imprisonment according to the gravity of the act. Our argumentation is supported by several um, legal arguments in international law, in particular the state of necessity, the fundamental change of circumstances, and the force majeure. When one of these arguments is being put forward, then the cancellation of debt is legitimate. Of course, this needs to be supported by people's mobilizations and by international solidarity. Only by having a political perspective on debt can we solve the problem of the debt crisis for the countries of the global south. To conclude, I invite you to visit the CLTM website where you can find a lot of analyses and a lot of uh, elements to uh, enlighten uh, this analysis on the debt issue. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Omar, for all those uh, proposed uh, measures and initiatives. Very much like others uh, have said, um, we can use international law in our interest. Some, something you said that I thought was very straightforward, but I think is also very clear to summarize things. The solutions that have been put forward really only serve to distract us from what would be real solutions. Let's turn our attention now to the questions that have been 
raised by participants. We have a question from uh, Aurélien. What is the share of private creditors as opposed to bilateral and uh, multilateral creditors? And who would be the quote unquote losers in the event of a partial or total cancellation? So I suggest we take four questions from participants first and then Juan Pablo, Yolanda, Ndongo and Omar, uh, you can answer. And even if a question isn't directed to you, uh, don't hesitate to uh, to uh, answer. I actually was curious about this question of private and bilateral and multilateral uh, creditors as well. Uh, and, and as well, and I had a question about private creditors. What do we have to what do we have to say, or what can one do about private uh, lenders? I think that's an important question. For example, when those uh, private lenders uh, come from the South themselves, then... Uh, and what is similar about the current situation and the campaign for Jubilee campaign for cancellation in 2000, near 2000? That's the next question we have. What, uh, are the, who are the different players? Who are the different uh, forces involved? And what are the diff what are the, the difference in the context, the nature of the demands that are being put forward or should be put forward? Comparing those two contexts then. And a third question from Jacques Berthelot. Um, the question of repaying by the countries of the north to the south of the debt uh, owed to the countries of the south by the former colonial powers in terms of natural resources and capital that has been transferred transferred from the south to the north over the centuries uh, would any of you like to answer the questions uh, that have been uh, posed thus far over to you panelists as far as the question of private lenders is concerned, I don't have the exact numbers. In 2008, it was about 2008, it was about 42% for sub Saharan Africa external debt held by, by um, private lenders. Uh, there are the euro bonds. There are private uh, private banks. Uh, and uh, the in the chat here it says private lenders sixty percent of the public external debt uh, in uh, for countries in the global south. And. I think you can, the latest figures we have actually from 2019, and if you go into the World Bank figures, we there is a breakdown. For African countries, uh, Omar Aziki is speaking. I do have the figures for the uh, African countries, for African countries. Do you have those uh, figures, Omar? Yes. Oh, here we have them. Uh, we have a pie chart. So who holds African debt is the title of this uh, pie chart. This is uh, from an Oxfam report uh, to, in the year 2020. I can send you the link to the site and you can clearly see that private lenders account for 32%. Multilateral institutions hold 35%. And China, China holds 18%. And so, and that's the greater share, of course, now held by China than in the past. And the number of uh, private, the share held by private lenders has also incre increased. I think in the past, in earlier years, it had been 20, well, four or five years ago, it was about 27 or 28%. And, and, and it's increased. Why has it increased? Because they've benefited 
from the lending conditions. Uh, the, uh, they benefited from the competitive, uh, one could call competitive uh, lending rates on, uh, on global markets. And so private lending has indeed increased in, in terms of the share with, and they've imposed their own conditions. They, in all the measure, all the measures should be targeted really. And this is the contradiction what the IMF and the G20 are doing is that they're trying to get money to pay private lenders. That's what's at stake here. They're trying to ensure private le private lenders are are paid back. That's the contradiction. That's the whole paradox or problem of the current uh, infra architecture. Whereas we're 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 calling for the cancellation of these debts including to uh, private lenders. There are a whole number of conditions, interest rates, and so forth that are uh, really crushing uh, these countries and peoples uh, in the global south. So that's what I wanted to say about the, the share of uh, private lenders in the, in the overall uh, Af African debt. And uh, Rémy uh, said in the chat, that for all so-called developing countries, private debt, private lenders account for 60% of uh, debt. So it's even so it's even higher than just for African countries, which is the focus of the pie chart uh, Omar show, showed us. Did Yolanda want to say something? Yes, yes, he did want to speak. Go ahead, please. Sí, me gustaría. Um... Yes, I'd like to specify one thing. Um, so this has happened. There's one thing that has happened in all the regions in Latin America, in Asia. The weight of private creditors was already more important than in the case of Africa, but it has. We've seen an increase in private creditor importance, and bilateral and multilateral creditors are less important now. And what's also important is to see how the make up the composition of creditors has changed within those capsules so private creditors are no longer mainly private banks and they are but it's now really big investments as well and uh, the, the, who, these investors who invest in bonds on the private market so so when you have a bank that is identified and is clear you can also know who it is you're, you're dealing with and who the money gets returned to. In terms of bilateral, as Mar was saying, this has changed a lot because it's no longer the old colonizing countries in Europe and the United States. It's actually now China who provides a lot of the loans and other loaners. And then in terms of multilaterals, that has changed as well because there's been an increase uh, depending on the region. In the case of Africa, for example, there's the importance of the African Development Bank has increased and then other development banks um, and uh, the and the balance with the IMF has changed there and this could change in the next few years because the IMF is lending more than in previous years but it's important to understand how the situation has changed so um, debt in comparison with GDP has increased uh, when we compare with 2000 in all regions but it has also increased in terms of absolute terms we have to bear in, in mind that GDP has also increased over these years as well. So the percentage is uh, well, that has uh, changed as well. So um, the well, in these statistics, we don't see domestic debt. So debt to domestic actors in Latin America and Asia, and also to some degree in Africa, and then an increase in private debt as well. We, don't, we often don't pay attention to this, but private debt has increased a lot, particularly in Latin America and in Asia. And we know by experience from private, from previous experiences at the end of the 1990s and 2000s, the crisis in, the South, in Southeast Asia and in Southern Europe, well, we know from these that private debt crisis becomes a public debt crisis because you have to have bailouts at 
national level, and that always leads to increase, increases in, in, in debt across the board. And it's a time bomb above all in countries in the global south, which we hadn't seen previously. So the situation is much more complex because it's much more complex than in the 1980s or in the early 2000s when we had the Jubilee, the Jubilee um, program where it was easier to identify the enemy. Um, the, the World Bank, the IMF and the countries in the global north, and we were asking them to cancel debt. But now we have to ask these investors, these funds that are kind of invisible. And in our organization, we have got a few, uh, we've got some statistics to understand who these investment funds are, but these, this is not easy to access this information. So it's much more complex. And then the role of China is increasing as well. So I think it's important that we bear this in mind when thinking about civil society strategies, because we are not really dealing with the same people. There are many there, but there are actually many more um, agents involved than in previous years. Thank you. Merci, merci. Thank you. There was another question from Jacques or rather, Jacques, I mentioned this question earlier, that is all those uh, resources and capital that uh, that was transferred from the South to the North over the centuries uh, in toward the colonizing countries, uh, what about paying those debts back? Uh, ask Jacques. And then Regidas and a similar question what about the sources of funding, so for example, on taxation, if, if we cancel debts, but financing remains structurally weak, um, the lion's share of the problem will remain untouched, says Regis. Uh, so two more questions. There's a question from Françoise. What are the, what are the, what is the relationship between the CAD, CADTM with the European left in in the European Union. Uh, we hardly talk about this at all. I took, uh, I took a position a number of years ago to go into the details of the free trade agreements uh, between the EU and West Africa and Southern Africa. And then Christian Folio asks, is the problem of the debt not first and foremost a democratic question? and uh, to be raised within the with an outlook an anti a non-capitalist outlook so if any of the four of you would like to answer these questions and comments uh, please go ahead i'm i could say a few words on the question of these sources of funding yes please do earlier Uh, Ndongo was saying that the I was saying, and Ndongo was saying that the solution to uh, debt repayment uh, of cancellation was necessary but insufficient, and that we needed other measures to go hand in hand with the debt cancellation. And it, of course, so one of them, one of them key areas is around taxation. Implement taxes on the wealthy, on the uh, very rich, uh, increased uh, uh, income taxes and uh, corporate taxes, we would have to reform the tax system to go in the direction of tax justice, tax justice, which is necessar necessary to get adequate funding and to shift away from a tax system based on gathering taxes from uh, the poor layers of society. In the CADTM, we call for the socialization of banks. That is, make the banking sector a public service in order precisely, uh, in order precisely to provide zero zero percent loans 
and to to take on le justified legitimate debt that could be used for social and environmental projects and so there can be public lending but public lending that is legitimate and focused on human and social and environmental needs and which of course is uh, overseen by by the public interest and by active involvement of the uh, peoples and uh, communities uh, concerned. That's all I had to say about that. Thank you. Thank you. Regarding this question on the links between the CLETM and the European left, you can see an answer by Matt, who is a member of the CLETM staff. So, in particular, we have uh, relationships with the uh, GUE parliamentary group. But it must be said that uh, since uh, 2015 and the Greek uh, experience, the debt issue um, does not bring the left to a consensus. So, uh, and, and maybe it's not a priority for them. So, we are glad to uh, collaborate when we can, but it's not always doable. And here we have a question for Juan Pablo, which was just asked. So the question is the following. Why the United Nations and the UNCTAD, which are supposed to defend fundamental human rights, do not propose more radical solutions? Nowadays, despite interesting proposals, all the proposal it is going too fast. Uh, all the proposals are based on a potential structure, a potential reform of the international financial architecture and of its um, uh, bodies, such as uh, the Paris Club. I cannot speak on behalf of anybody, uh, even less, uh, even less uh, on behalf of the uh, UNCTAD or the UN. But we should define what ra radical means, right? Uh, there have been very interesting development both in the General Assembly with the uh, principles on, on debt restructuring in, in the resolution passed in 2015 and every year the human rights right council passes a resolution on on external debt and, and human rights and you can see from the path on the way in which developed countries vote every year this resolution uh, that they don't like it uh, they don't like the way in which the human rights council approaches uh, debt and, and human rights from different angles, uh, dealing with austerity, dealing with uh, debt relief, uh, even during the pandemic. So we should define what radical means uh, in, in this context. Um, I mean, I, I could refer to a number of resolutions passed during my tenure until last year, for example, the guiding principles on economic reforms and, and human rights, which were voted against by Brazil and most European countries, the US and the, the so-called B, uh, B group, because they consider that there are already beautiful uh, international institutions dealing with um, financial affairs, mainly Bretton Woods. But you know, when you go to uh, the IMF and the World Bank to engage in discussion regarding human rights and finance. They will say, I'm sorry, but human rights do not fall within my mandate. So at the end of, of the day, it's, a, it's kind of circular um, argument where the ultimate purpose is that there are no international fora where in, um, human rights and finance can be discussed together. Ouais. Merci, merci pour ces apports. 
Um, All right, thank you for your inputs. Here I can see two questions, one for Yolanda and one for Ndongo. So the question for Yolanda is a long one. Eurodad and your network do a remarkable work on the debt, both in terms of organizing organizations together on the internet and the international level as well as putting proposals forward on the international level but i regret that the proposals carried by the network um, are mainly based on a change of the uh, international financial structure architecture just like in the 90s such an initiative uh, seems to be uh, doomed to fail, why not draw lessons from the um, uh, heavily indebted poorest countries initiative and its failure? Why not call for um, debt cancellation and debt non-payment? CLDTM and several uh, analyses by economists show that uh, debt cancellation can allow a country to uh, get out way better than the solutions of alleviating debt by the international financial architecture. And now the question for Ndongo. Ndongo, do you think that suspending debt repayment could be a first step towards exiting the debt system, the uh, debt trap, and the uh, contradictions of the capitalist system? Empiezo yo. Okay, so Eurodat is a network of European organizations and we mainly work with European governments and we do advocacy with the European institutions and Eurodat has changed its position and it has adopted a position which is more, which is maybe more radical um, and so we do support um, suspending payments and well it's not just that we well it's uh, really our strategic position and it's really the members of the network it's not so much the it's not so much Eurodat itself it's really those who uh, it's really our members who shape our position so I could share with you the Eurodat positions which are more institutional and uh, the uh, it's about changing the institutions but really it's about the international coalition that has come together and we shape that those demands of protecting countries in the global south um, helping them when they suspend their payments and so in order to well this is personal here but a personal opinion if we well networks like uh, Eurodat and others we are in favor of placing more pressure on the work of uh, legitimate debt as, as was the case in the past or suspending payments. And we should have a better position from countries in the global south, particularly governments, but also the networks that work on debt issues. And CADTM, I understand that they do, but um, then there are, kind of, there are also organizations in the global south who have other, who have positions on suspending payments. And so having some rulers or representatives or former rulers in some countries in the global south who support the need to not pay debt, well, that, that call which, which Thomas Sankara put out on setting up a group of debtors that together didn't refuse to pay debt, that would actually make it easier for networks in the global north, for example, Eurodat, our organization, to actually develop our position. So personally, I don't really believe in that hope to reform the financial institutions, the international financial institutions. And also I believe that the work of Eurodat focuses, should focus on um, organ European institutions, UN institutions, asking them to adopt resolutions which are useful when it comes to applying pressure on countries in uh, taking steps forward in suspending payments or uh, demands on certain reforms that can make it easier to suspend payments. And then there's the work that CIDTM has done in um, 
uh, having more uh, rules and protection for cre in creditor countries so that countries that do want to suspend their payment of debt, they should feel safe. So, for example, changes in legislation to protect against the vulture funds so that we don't have the same as the same things happening as in Argentina. That's one key thing. But anyway, in summary, it is, well, in order to change the positions of Eurodat, we would have to change our member organizations. Um, the organizations would have to change their opinions, their own member organizations, but a stronger position from civil society in the global south would also make it easier to change our positions and to have a more radical position if and a more anti-capitalist position as well. Thank you. Merci, Yolanda, for your réponse. Je vais passer la parole à Ndongo. Thank you, Yolanda, for your answer. Now I'll give the floor to Ndongo. Thank you, Anais. Well, suspending debt servicing would be a relief for several countries. And of course, we should not um, we should not be greedy or uh, we should not like throw this out of the window. Anything that can be done is, uh, is a good step. But suspending servicing the debt is not enough because the states need to have access to um, additional resources. So these countries have to do more, but the international context is not in their favor. So countries nowadays, they say, well, we would like to suspend the repayment of debt, but we cannot do it because if we do it, we will have, we will have a more difficult access to international capitals and to international markets. So we will show that we are, um, financially solid and we will indebt ourselves on the international markets and then we'll see in, in benin in africa they said answering answering uh, another government which said uh, we should cancel the debt the benin came came forward and said or oh, the benin's government came forward and said no 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 we do not want to cancel um, we do not want to stop repayments because we want to 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 continue to keep on going to the international market so this is why we need as sankara demanded we need a united front against debt we need all countries that are interested in such a solution to unite together. This would be a solution. The other thing is that if we want to put an end to the debt, to the recurring debt crisis, which is recurring every every 20 years or something like that, then we need to change the developmental models based on dependency from the global north and dependency from China. Uh, researchers in the 70s said that uh, a global South country cannot, um, cannot keep track with the global North because the um, enriching of the global North was based on an ecological model, which uh, does not exist anymore and was based on exceptionalism. Nowadays, we need development models based on local realities and sustainable development and so on. The other thing is that a developmental model based on the financial international architecture needs to be based on what could be called the Ponzi scheme. Because you always need to generate new income to repay for uh, 
previous loans and so on. This is why we need to change the international financial system completely. We need the international the, the financial system to allow uh, productive activities to be led uh, in in the countries of the global south. Thank you, Andongo. Maybe when you when you said that we need a united front against debt, uh, this may answer what Yolanda said as well. Uh, the fact that uh, they need uh, some more radical positions uh, from the from the governments of the global south. Uh, Omar, there was a question being uh, being asked um, on the on the current state of the Moroccan public debt um, and whether whether Morocco took an initiative to stop the repayment of a part of or the totality of its debt. Thank you, Anaïs. First of all, I, I saw that Jacques Berthelot made a remark on the Samoa Agreement, which will replace the Cotonou Agreement in January 2022 which is based mainly on the deepening of the uh, economic partnerships agreement. So let me first answer this question related to the relationship between debt and the uh, Cotonou agreements. In Seattle Time Attack Morocco, we initiated an appeal on the North Africa level calling for debt cancellation and the cancellation of um, free trade agreements because these are two tools of um, imperialist domination. when you take the example given by Jacques Berthelot, but also when you look at uh, Morocco or Tunisia, which nowadays negotiate a free trade agreement, which are called uh, exhaustive and deep, Well, this goes hand in hand with the debt system being promoted by the IMF and the World Bank, because the aim of this debt system is to open the economies of the global south, to open them to um, a foreign, to international investments by the uh, global north. This destroys our local economies, and they do so while they repatriate the profits to uh, they take the profits back home. So the free trade agreements um, are a similar tool as the debt system, and therefore we need to fire them too. As Ndongo said, disconnecting from the global debt system goes together with uh, the cancellation of debt and cancellation of free trade agreements. Now on the debt of Morocco, uh, Remy sent a link about this. Uh, since the beginning of the beginning of the pandemic, we've seen a huge number of loans taken out by Morocco for the IMF or from the other regional banks. It's, it's even difficult to keep up now with all the different loans that have been taken. We have to update our, our, our database, all the different uh, loan contracts that uh, Morocco has signed. Uh, and but and yet Morocco has never called for uh, debt cancellation. On the contrary, it's been a fierce opponent. Uh, 
the IMF gave it a, a, a precautionary line of credit. It's actually paid this off early. And it, the point is uh, Morocco wants to get a, a high rating from the different lending uh, institutions. Thank you, Omar. We have about 10 minutes left. Perhaps uh, I could just uh, ask another one of the written questions, a question from Deo who asks, how can we strike, uh, how can we reconcile a policy of debt cancellation with the urgent need to fight against poverty in the countries of the global south. I think all of you have already answered this in a way. Uh, if you take bits and pieces of your different answers, well, Juan Pablo uh, talked about risk premiums and, uh, and he talked about removing the risk premium to release more resources for poor countries. That's uh, one part of the answer. Would others like to take a stab at Deo's question, that might be a nice way to wrap up our uh, discussion today. Would any one of you, or would any one of you like to answer the question from Deo? It's too big. Hmm. Ouais. True. En tout cas, moi, je retiens de, voilà. What, well, what I take away from your remarks is, uh, first of all, that you made a number, you proposed a number of uh, solutions. It would be interesting to, to dig into those solutions a bit more to explore them a bit more closely. Uh, it doesn't happen very often, but it, it would appear that we're going to end today's session early. Maybe we could just leave things uh, there for this evening. Thanks to all four of you for your presentations, for your comments. Uh, I thought the exchange was very rich, very insightful. Uh, please take a look at the upcoming events. Uh, Yolanda posted a list of events that are coming up in October and November. I think there are a number of important events. Uh, there will be the FIMF autumn meeting and uh, of the World Bank as well. And in November, on November 19th, we're the CADTM in partnership with Entraide and Fraternité. We're organizing an international seminar at the federal parliament here in Belgium. And we'll be looking at the involvement of international financial institutions in the growing indebtedness of the countries of the global south and also the growing role of private lenders will be having a two-part meeting looking at these questions so it'll be an international seminar with participants from peru and senegal and our goal is also uh, to address uh, our concerns and demands to the Belgian government. Uh, information uh, will be uh, posted on the CADTM website very soon. I think this uh, will be an important event. And of course, don't forget the petition that the National Working Group on Debt, uh, the, the petition they've uh, drafted on uh, debt, uh, and that was posted in the chat. So we'll we'll look. I look forward to seeing everyone again soon to uh, further our discussions uh, on uh, the search for solutions to the debt crisis. Thank you to everyone. Thank you to the interpreters, says uh, Omar, and thank you from the interpreters to one and all. Sorry for some of the technical.